Hello and welcome to Managing Developer Workflows with the Kubernetes API. My name is Colin Murphy. I'm an engineering manager at Adobe. First thing I'd like to do is cover why we chose to write our own Kubernetes client. And then I'll show you how we did it. As I said, I'm an engineering manager. My current responsibility is the infrastructure for Document Cloud, both the architecture and the software. Why write your own Kubernetes client? You certainly could just write a bunch of bash scripts with kubectl, throw that into Jenkins and get 80% of what you could hope to achieve with, with your own Kubernetes client. Is it really worth all the effort to, for that extra 20%? For us, the overriding reason is that just like anything at a large company like at Adobe, you're never in a green field. You always have lots of other things to consider. Uh, first off, all of these applications were, our, were already deployed, either on DCOS or another uh, homespun container orchestration system. So we needed to go from those configurations onto Kubernetes in a seamless manner. So the, the first one is, is really, we want to prevent outages, right? We need to exert a greater control over what our application teams can do than just saying, you know, here's kubectl, here are some YAML files, go have at it, right? You, you do that, you're gonna have, you're gonna have outages because people just don't understand Kubernetes. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. But you also wanna limit the Kubernetes objects you have, you know, potentially apply labels, keep them from interfering with each other. And, and all this, this is really just to say, uh, I should point out that it's not a substitution for, you know, RBAC, network, network segmentation, open policy agent, uh, other controls on the on the control plane side that you'd wanted to uh, implement to protect. So this isn't this isn't a replacement for those. It's just a it's just an, a nice uh, supplementary thing. So we also, as I mentioned, it was it's it's not a greenfield, right? We had an existing deployment system. We call it Moonbeam. It, it actually made the, the problem statement a little easier because we knew we just had a SHA and that's all we had to do a deployment. So a Git repo, a SHA, and that, that made it kind of easy to, to start as a nice place to start. But, you know, we couldn't just use Spinnaker because we already had a bunch of stuff that, that Spinnaker can do and, and same, likewise for other tooling out there. So, so, you know, the other big thing, right? We want to reduce cognitive load application engineers they have a deep technical knowledge right they understand you know how to manipulate a pdf or or a echo sign agreement or maybe some sort of uh, machine learning they don't really have time to do kubernetes right i mean if we, there's no such thing as a person who fully understands uh, everything that's required in a in a web application right and then we had our site reliability engineers and and really they had the same story right they have there's a huge legacy application it, it it needs constant attention they don't have time to you know learn this whole other system kubernetes we also have lots of compliance and on and tickets so it just it's just not a thing that we could just oh let's just re-educate hundreds of people on how to do something another reason is 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 secret management we use HashiCorp Vault at Adobe. And, and we really can't have, especially some of the, the clusters with very complex requirements. You know, we have, we're gonna have FedRAMP clusters coming online, but we have PCI, HIPAA. We can't, we can't always have a connection to some sort of, from a cluster to a secrets management. So we really had to find a way to package up all the secrets an application could need from within our internal network and, and push that in, in a safe way out to uh, Kubernetes cluster in a way that would, you know, allow, allow for rollback, make sure there wasn't a way that it would interfere with, with secrets in the next release, that kind of thing. And then lastly, it's really, it's just not that hard. It's, it's very simple. It's fairly well documented. If you understand, if you know Kubernetes, if you're familiar with the concepts of Kubernetes, you can write a Kubernetes client. I mean, 
Go is a little bit of a learning curve. You don't have to, of course, write your your client in Go, but it's probably the best supported SDK that I, at least at the time I wrote I wrote the client. Okay, before we continue, just want to point out that the client has been open sourced. It's on GitHub, at Adobe slash ported to Kubernetes. So moving on to the requirements, I know I've already briefly touched on them. The first one being just that we were migrating from another system or two other systems onto a single system. So we had to have the way that secrets were retrieved, have the way that environment variables were set to be the same. And then also the code had to be the same too, the, the application code. So we couldn't change anything and how that was formatted You know, in addition to that, we needed teams to just to, we needed teams to migrate right away, <laughs> or or at least migrate without talking to each and every single one of them and treating them as each. Uh, it's a special little snowflake. So we had we did a lot of work around automating automation, generating the right files for te for teams automatically, and that's still true now. So our onboarding system. We'll give. We'll stub out the directories required, and teams can kind of just go from there. Uh, there's, there, there really is. Don't we don't have, as I pointed out, we don't have a team that can just oh meet, you know, meet with a new service every time there's a new service, right, and and figure out what they need, unless they need something new and different that we don't we don't support. One really key thing and a real improvement over our previous systems was this whole idea of segmentation of responsibilities. We allow teams to do a lot within their repository, generating service instances, generating operator instances so that, that allow them to create MySQL databases or DynamoDB or various Azure backing stores, things like that. And we let them. That's all their their responsibility, and they and this tool allows them to do it. You know, through through Kubernetes objects. We'll touch on a little bit because that that does cause some problems. But and we certainly don't allow them to do whatever they want. But but uh, certainly a lot more freedom than they had before. There's no other. They don't have to learn some other system of you know cloud formation templates or some internal system we have that generates infrastructure code that kind of thing. It's it's all completely in their control. And also, you know, sometimes uh, in a previous system we had, you'd have to go to some other service if you wanted to make a certain kind of change to your service. So another uh, internal web UI and you'd have to click through it and, you know, it takes some time. And so this, this, uh, that was another thing we really wanted to get rid of was, was anything like that, right? It's just, there's a single deployment system, as I showed a few slides before, you can make any change to your service using that system. And and for change management, that system we, we we rely on that system to to verify that you know the proper approvals have been made and reviews and things like that. There's a concept. This is a little bit of a stretch, but there's this concept of hermetic builds from the SRE manual that that I think hopefully most of you have already already built that way, which is you know no to build dependencies on the uh, on the build system, right? So easiest way to do that is to build in Docker. And, but I've kind of, if you kind of can stretch, stretch that a little bit to deployments, right? You don't want a service to roll back and have that help, have that rollback behave differently. That, that rollback, once you roll back a service, you don't want it to now behave differently than it where, where it was when it was at that previous version. So, so we really want to tie the secrets and the environment variables of a specific Git SHA for the service to, to, to that deployment in Kubernetes. So every deployment is that our, that our client deploys has, has the SHA labeled and, and it 
and it, we have we inject into it a config map and secrets, uh, a Kubernetes secret with that SHA. So if we ever roll back, even if you know our uh, that secret was changed somewhere in 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 HashiCorp Vault, we're still getting those those secrets, and we keep up to five. So you can't roll. You know, if you roll back more than five previous deployments, then I guess you could you could potentially get a, a secret change. But we really just we want to have that. If you ever roll back, you know that you're going to a safe place. And then one last thing is we, you know, I, I might have kind of inferred this, but we deploy to multiple cloud providers and and some applications actually deploy to data centers. And we wanted to abstract that away from, from the service team. We didn't want the service team to say, oh, I need, you know, a different domain name because I'm in this, or this is HIPAA compliant, or, oh, it's FedRAMP, so I have to, you know, to make sure my Kubernetes configuration is a little different. So, so the idea was we're going to have a con the configuration live in each Kubernetes cluster. And actually, in an, it's a per namespace configuration. And we'll have the client, as it deploys, read that read in that, that information and modify the objects as required. It sounds actually kind of complicated. I'm sure we could have gone crazy with it. It's actually not that hard. Uh, for the most part, it's really just the Docker registry whether it's used, whether the cluster has Istio or Contour, and and also domain names. But you know, it, it'll, it'll, I'm sure it'll expand as we go. But it it was it was it's kind of a nice idea to just have all that configuration, the common configuration for all the applications, just live in the in the namespace. Uh, saves us a, a lot of effort. Okay, so moving on to how the Ported to Kubernetes works. We take the SHA, we clone the service repository, and and we kind of go from there. We read in a bunch of environment variables and secret references. I'll just I'll show you what those look like in a second. Then we read the cluster configuration from the cluster itself, and then we compare to what we have for up for an update, and we update the update the Kubernetes objects as required. So I'll just show you quickly because I couldn't get it into a slide what what these what these configuration files look like. So it's a it's a nested directory structure. We have a file uh, we try to keep it really dry so these these files will reference each other. Uh, we need at least one for every environment for every for every region, and uh, and as I said, they can they can reference each other. So, you know, well, there's one that's common for all AWS. There's one for, that's common for all Azure. Uh, you know, it's just all about it's all about scalability. That's that's the name of the game. So, as long, uh, so it, it looks a little intimidating. It's a lot of files, but it's it, it's it's fairly straightforward. So in, in those in those files we have four different environment types. So in configuration environment entries, the the first is is most straightforward, an environment variable and the and the value. We also have, as I mentioned many times now, uh, secret references, so vault paths. Uh, we also have the ability to override cluster settings. So say you had a different cert certificate. And you had needed a different domain name for TLS cert, right? For or if you know you didn't want to, uh, you didn't want to use the same gateway for Istio gateway or Contour ingress, that kind of thing, as the other services in your namespace. And you know, it's it's always it's a constant fight. <laughs> We're always always getting requests for more features. We'll probably have to expand it a little bit, either some kind of annotations structure or something like that, because it, it's, it gets very complicated with multiple ingress controllers, things like that. So 
this uh, I wanted to kind of show this. This is, I guess, the first code. It's, it's. I was surprised how difficult it is to show code in a presentation. I just want to credit Catherine Cox Boudet. I read her book Concurrency and Go when I got started. She had this concept of pipelines that she talked about that I had never seen in another language. Maybe all of you are really familiar with it, but but basically you're just passing a channel here um, from in a nested kind of function structure, and it's a really efficient and uh, and clever way to to it's not it's it's it is you know parallel computing, but it's it's not uh, it's not you know obvious uh, embarrassingly parallel, but you're passing through each region individually in a in a kind of a in a elegant way. But here we're just we're basically creating a a struct for each region that's going to be deployed to every each cluster each namespace that's being going to be deployed to. For us, it's typically along regions, and we. So what we're doing here is we're we're getting that configuration, we're fetching the secrets, we're copy, we're reading in the objects, we're copying the objects, doing a deep copy because we're going to modify them. Uh, that was a, a lesson learned, right? You don't, <laughs> you you have a pointer to a struct. If you modify it for one region, it's going to modify it for all regions. So, deep copy function uh, method, uh, actually, and then and then we get this 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 big struct that has all the information we need to do our deployment. The way we handle cube conf configs is we have just we have a file that lists that's common to all of our services and it just lists out all of the all of the cube configs uh, in their locations in vault. We act, we use uh, AWS IAM authentication for our, our EKS clusters we use Active Directory auth authentication, Azure Active Directory authentication for our Azure clusters. So it's not really they're not really secrets, but it's just a it's it's it makes all the security people happy, right? It's giving warm fuzzy feeling. All of our cube configs are uh, in vault, and and they get pulled down at at deploy time for every service deployment. The next thing I wanted to talk about is structured client sets versus dynamic. So I really like the the client sets. I really like the schemes that, you know, you find those for all the Kubernetes objects. Recently, I think in the last year or so, Istio put out their own client library, they call it. We use the service catalog that has its own. Unfortunately, the new, newer stuff doesn't. So the Azure, sorry, the Azure service operator and the AWS controller for Kubernetes, they they don't provide these. So we, we have to actually do dynamic. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. It's kind of an upcoming challenge for this. But but yeah, we just use the universal deserializer. Just read in YAML. It's really straightforward, really easy. And then we have a you know a struct with all the all of the possible Kubernetes objects that we can apply. And you know, there's only a finite number, right? As opposed to when we get into custom operators, it it really uh, it really expands, and we have to kind of find a new way to do things. But for right now, this is what works, and this is what we do. The, the nice thing also about the schemes and and the type client sets is it's really easy. Like for instance, we have to always make sure that we you know, if if, it, if somebody for some reason puts a number of replicas in their deployment, we, we typically discourage people from doing that because we want people to use horizontal pod autoscalers. If they have a horizontal pod autoscaler, we, we always we want to make sure that when they deploy, they don't reset the number of replicas. So just, you know, something like this, really basic. We just, we can, we don't have to transverse a, a map of, of strings to interface, right? We just spell out the, the whole the path. Actually, in, so sorry. In this case, it's actually just making sure that the horizontal pod scaler references the deployment that is actually being deployed. We don't want somebody to make a horizontal pod scaler that that modifies someone else's. 
deployment. That, you know, that, that happens. People copy from one another as much as we try to, you know, automatically stub things out. It's just, it's just a reality when you have this many services, right? Hundreds of, hundreds of engineers and, and, you know, over a hundred services. So, and as we expand this actually out to more people in Adobe, we're now we're going to talk about thousands and, you know, th thousands of engineers and potentially thousands of services. So, so yeah, just these kind of little little things, really easy to do with the type client set. Cluster settings. So these are these are when I I talked before I, I mentioned that uh, there's a cluster specific information, and it's we've we've done a kind of a good job limiting it because you could really go crazy here. But these the the real you know the the, the kind of the obvious things. So registry, we have registries in every region. You know, we don't want an outage, say, of AWS in the EU Central One knocking out our Azure in, you know, Singapore, right? So, so we, we always want, uh, in our deployment strategy, we always have a, a regional registry. So that has to change for deployment. And we don't want the, we, we don't want, that's not the en uh, application engineer's problem, right? So uh, in their deployment.yaml, they don't have to, they, they kind of just, there's just kind of whatever, you know my registry, and then, and then the name of their, their Docker image for the, for, so so that that just gets overridden. It doesn't it doesn't, the you know, ported Kubernetes can handle that. Whether the whether the cluster has Istio or not, the domain name of the services in that namespace, the Istio gateway if there's Istio. So, the, a minimum number for the HPAs. We typically, you know, if it's in production, you need, you need two, some services need, you know, a lot more than that, but, but we always want at least some redundancy, um, sometimes three for, for some heavier used clusters. And then what, you know, what is the cloud? Is it Azure? Is it AWS? What is the cloud location? This is typically used for the service instances. You know, is this a, is this, you know, how, what does the cloud provider call their region? And that that's useful for um, setting the location in, say, an Azure service instance, or in or the Azure service operator, or or the AWS equivalents. And then let's see, update. So this is we we this is how the updates happen. It's you know it's kind of. If, if if you're familiar with Go, this is kind of probably not that interesting. But if you're not, this uh, this is you know this is basically how we do it. We, there's an update function defined for every type of Kubernetes object because we have those those uh, type client sets, and basically just make a work make a wait group. We run that function, and then once they're all done, then we then we we exit out of this 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 updater, we this ex updater returns the the, uh, the 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 channels with the results, and then it gets called again in a for loop for th for the next update function, and and just iterates through. Obviously, the The fact that every namespace can be updated simultaneously, it's a, you know, it's an, it's an embarrassingly parallel operation. So there's nothing, nothing too clever there. Just a, just a fan, fan out, fan in and, uh, and check the results. Okay. So to wrap up, I just want to go over some of the things we're working on now. <clears throat> the first is we have the AWS controller for Kubernetes and the Azure service operator, we're working on supporting those. And they come with this whole mess of CRDs. It's going to be a common problem if anybody wants to write their own Kubernetes client, you're going to run into this issue, unless you're very specific in what you want to do. If you want to just support, you know, hundreds of engineers, you're going to, you're going to need to, you're going to run into this problem where there's just too many CRDs. And unfortunately, uh, the ACK and the ASO, they don't come with client sets or schemes. So, you can either generate them yourself, which sounds like not a lot of fun, or you can use the dynamic client. 
as I mentioned previously, the dynamic client has a few drawbacks because you don't have an actual struct that you can really pin down and, and grab something and compare it to something else, right? It's it's a it's a map of a string to an interface, right? But you know, going to try to work through that and and see what we can do. I mean, right now we're just reading it into an instruction unstructured type, like Kubernetes API unstructured type. And and then using the Kubernetes Go client to apply that, we'll see. Not not quite done, so I don't really want to show it in action, especially if it turns out to to not work at all. And then the other thing is that we have this situation where teams don't want to deploy every object to every namespace, or they want to have a certain type of ingress that they're used for that they use instead of you know instead of just every every pot you know ingress that's available so it's kind of how how teams can fine tune things and as i mentioned before we have the ability to override the the proteus to kubernetes um you know the region the the registry those 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 configurations but but it, that's that that's kind of a little bit too blunt of an instrument so so we're going to work on that probably some type of annotation or label that people put in their kubernetes objects in their K8 directory inside their inside their repository. Looks like that's what we will do, but you know, still haven't still haven't decided yet. So I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you for bearing with me at the with the lighting, which is super inconsistent. I don't have any good you know lights, so I'm kind of using the sun, and that's kind of fickle. And then also, if you want to reach out, uh, ask me anything on the Kubernetes Slack. I'm, I'm there. Uh, I don't use Twitter. I try to maintain my sanity, but, but please, you know, please try it out. You know, the as I said, this is all on Git. It's it's meant to be really a reference for other people to use. But you could, you know, you could use it. We use it here at Adobe, for for lots of services that that are that are run every that you know heavily used. So please, please take a look. Thanks. Bye.